Hello and welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our participants all over the place. Here we are. So today we have an amazing group of women who are going to tell us about a rescue cookbook. And uh, Caitlin Bryson will be the host. I'll be on the sidelines moderating. So I will pass it right away to Caitlin. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you for hosting this. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for everyone who's joining. And uh, we have a really exciting and dynamic panel for everyone who's watching out there. And um, actually, Isabel, I'm going to kick it off to you first. Awesome. Hey everyone all over the world. As Victoria said, we're super excited to be here with you today and share this virtual space. Um, this is the Climate Chamber Rescue Cookbook panel, a prototype for food salvage communities. And we have a fun performative presentation planned for you today. Um, before we really jump into the meat of discussing what the Rescue Cookbook is and how it came about, I will do a brief introduction, who we are, uh, the context under which this project was developed, and then we'll have a fun interactive Q&A with all of our cooks. You'll notice a few uh, folks in their Zoom boxes here are busy in their kitchens. Um, so we have Sharona Florsheim, who's visiting us from Israel. Maru Garcia, uh, who is here in Los Angeles, uh, Jana Avner, who's also here in Los Angeles, and then your moderators or conductors of our choreography today will be myself. My name's Isabel Beavers. Um, I'm an artist and educator based here in Los Angeles. We have Scarlett Kim, who is a director and artist and um, a close partner of mine who I worked with at Culture Hub LA. And of course, who you've already met, Caitlin Bryson, who was one of our co-hosts at UCLA Art Science Center for the original Climate Chamber. Um, so just so you know right away, the Rescue Cookbook is a project prototype uh, it serves as an art side tech platform to stop food waste mismanagement through community run directories that locate and salvage edible food sources. And the Rescue Cookbook team believes that reducing food waste begins with our households through conscientious shopping and prevention. So the Rescue Cookbook fosters community teamwork through food finding, deal locating, recipe sharing, and composting tips. Um, edible food can be reused in novel ways that would otherwise go to waste, and an edible food can be composted as a better alternative to landfills. Um, so we will get much deeper into what the Rescue Cookbook is and how it operates. Um, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this project developed. So I was um, a resident artist with Culture Hub LA this past year, which was an incredible experience um, and an organization that's really excited about collaboration and experimentation. And we developed Climate Chamber, which is a mini virtual hackathon. Um, and this was created originally for uh, ReFest, which is Culture Hub's annual art exhibition and um, organizational project that features resident artists past and present, as well as curates many other artists, both in Los Angeles and New York. Um, and as many folks had to adjust this year, we had to quickly move this program, Climate Chamber, which was planned as an in-person hackathon, to a virtual space. Um, this was happening right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that also shifted some of the context and ideas within which we were considering this experimentation and creative project production. So the goal of Climate Chamber was to bring multidisciplinary teams together in this virtual space to have a sprint of ideas and generate creative projects that approach the intersection of art, science, technology, and climate change. Um, so the teams that came together for this virtual hackathon, which was hosted all on Zoom, um, were technologists, they were scientists, artists, choreographers, designers. And what we really wanted to do was facilitate the intensity that happens in hackathons that are usually designed for the tech field, but around creative artistic production. 
Um, all of us who work in collaborative methods know how incredible things can be when we bring folks from many backgrounds, perspectives, um, silos, and areas of expertise together. So the teams in the hackathon had quite a challenge set ahead of them. They essentially had one day to come together, most of the time with folks they had never met before, and develop a project related to a climate change issue of their choice. So they were challenged with identifying an issue and working in a team to come up with a creative solution or intervention that would address this issue. Um, an extra lens that was put on this project was thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic. How could this project get off the ground working in a remote way? And then in reverse, how could that happen in physical space should we be able to gather again? So there was quite the challenge that all, all of the teams um, were tasked with, but this team that you're meeting here, the Rescue Cookbook, was the winning, winning team. Uh, and we'll get into why, but first I'd like to spend a little time also introducing the co-hosts of Climate Chamber. So this virtual hackathon was co-hosted with Culture Hub LA and UCLA Art Science Center. So I'll hand it over first to Scarlett Kim, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Culture Hub LA, um, and why you all were interested in working on Climate Chamber. Thank you, Isabel. My name is Scarlett Kim. Uh, I'm a Programs and Projects Manager with Culture Up LA. Um, Culture Up is a global art and technology center with studios in New York, LA, as well as Korea, Indonesia, and Italy, and constantly expanding. Um, we're providing, um, our mission is to provide connected environments for artists to experiment with um, technologically informed work. We do that through residencies, uh, live productions, and educational programming, and so much more. Isabel was one of our resident artists for this past year, and like Isabel mentioned, um, Climate Chamber was something that uh, was born for ReFest, which is our annual festival bringing together artists, technologists, and activists. We were really excited and honored to host such an exciting interdisciplinary chamber for social change, um, and excited to support uh, this project, the Rescue Cookbook, that was born out of um, that context. Um, yeah, thank you, and looking forward to talking to everyone more today. Um. Awesome. And Caitlin, would you like to introduce UCLA Art Science Center's role in Climate Chamber? Yes. So we um, are the Art Science Center. I am the assistant to the center and to Victoria, who's here. And we were established in 2005 by Victoria um, with this intention of bringing these, quote unquote, two cultures together, art and science. And Victoria started this program with the belief and knowledge that through um, deep art and science collaborations, real um, genuine innovations could happen, especially when it comes to critical issues such as climate change. Um, and since this is, there's this huge impetus on collaboration and creating culture, um, the Art Science Center has facilitated programming, symposia, mixers, exhibition that really sort of drive this community collaborative culture home. And so for um, this project was a perfect sort of merge of all of these different um, aspects bringing the climate chamber and culture hub together to help facilitate um, the hackathon and also to just get to hear such amazing ideas and learn from a lot of people. Um, and so we were brought on uh, as sort of a panel of judges, um, some members from our team with Victoria and our scientific director, Dr. Jim Jimjeski, um, and John Brumley and I were all on the, the panel of judges with a few other people and we got to hear about these incredible um, projects and then eventually landed on the rescue cookbook. So that was our role and yeah, Isabel. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, we were so grateful to have this expansive network of partners to work with for the Climate Chamber. And, you know, it, it first seemed like quite a challenge to move this event online and to be virtual and remote, as I'm sure many who are participating in Ars Electronica have experienced. But I think what we found is that that only expanded our networks further. We were able to meet with Sharona from Israel because we were hosted in this virtual space, which might not have been possible if we were all physically based in LA. Um, but as Caitlin mentioned, we had a jury of eight, uh, eight jurors who came from UCLA Art Science Center's network, Culture Hub LA's network, and the jury itself was multidisciplinary. 
Um, and there were many reasons why this project was chosen as the winning project. Um, the Rescue Cookbook really at, approaches a critical issue, not only for climate change, but one that is heightened during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is thinking about food waste, food salvage, and food insecurity. As I mentioned, the challenge was to think of a project that is art-based, that also speaks to technology and really approaches a social issue. And we felt like this project and its grassroots um, organization and, and its simplicity in approaching a, an issue that approaches the local and global was a really nice way to consider all of these issues and a multidisciplinary project that could be applied in many locations through the globe. Um, and Scarlett and Caitlin, if you want to jump in and, and say any additional strengths that you all found in this project uh, before we dig into some more of questions for our cooks here. Well, I'll jump ah, in just for a second. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, all the projects were amazing and dealing with climate change obviously is the most important issue. In fact, we're calling it climate disruption now because it's not just about change, it's about us about literally disrupting. And um, food is really at the center of both our survival, meaning what we eat, how we distribute, how we produce, but even further than that, just thinking about nourishment and culture and ecology. So we felt that this project had that kind of complexity. And um, we also knew Mara's work from before, so we had confidence that she could deliver. So <laughs> it's a great group. And it was great to meet uh, Sharona and know that it's actually extending it out to Israel. Pretty cool. Thank you, Victoria, for that. Um, and yeah, from Culture Hub's perspective, uh, a lot of what we do is facilitate collaboration between our studios around the world. So we were really excited to be able to support a um, project that really um, has accessibility in mind um, across global locations and into a variety of communities around the world. And um, and we also support a range of technologies from something ranging from something more DIY um, or to the cut and to the cutting edge of whatever's happening right now. So in, in that context, we were really um, inspired by the grassroots ethos, the peer to peer approach, uh, something that feels very accessible and something that um, has a wide ranging uh, possibility for uh, people of all kinds. Thank you, Scarlett. Yeah, and I mean, I think that in terms of just even to be sort of echoing all of these different thoughts, but that wasting resources, even on the sort of food scale, is really symbolic of how we treat our resources in general and our, our bodies are sort of how, yeah, mimicking how we treat the earth in general. So to teach and focus on, um, again, creating culture, so using food and creating culture around sustainability. Um, that really ripples outward into sort of the fabric of society and then you get to also have um, sort of intimate engagements with storytelling, with food sharing and um, food sovereignty. I think that it extends into that as well. And this really actually initiates a capacity to change. Um, one of the, the sort of key judging points, I guess, was whether or not the, the project had the capacity to implement an actual change. And I think that all of the panelists agree that this really had um, it had the potential to do that through the creation of community and, and culture. Wonderful. Thanks all for um, that. And it reminds me too that one of the hopes of the Climate Chamber was that all projects would take on another life after we had this one intensive day of um, working together and brainstorming. And as everyone is mentioning, this project absolutely immediately started to take on its own life and we'll share all with all of you more how you can become involved after the presentation today. Um, so I think it's time to get to know our cooks a little bit better. Um, I'll contextualize this next portion of the presentation by saying that we wanted to find a way to enact the core ideas of the rescue cookbook with you in a virtual space, you being the audience. So although we cannot all directly um, 
interact today. We hope that through sharing the intimacy of the kitchen, of cooking, of food stories and food ritual, we can create a little bit more um, proximity with you all and, and really get to the core ideas of the rescue cookbook. Um, so first I'll have our cooks introduce themselves um, a little bit about what they're cooking today, what food they are salvaging, and then a little bit about their artistic practice. Let's start with Sharona. You look ready, ready to share. Hi. So yes, I am really grateful that I was able actually to participate in this hackathon. And of course it's my gratitude, my gratitude goes to the virus. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, of course, not being in LA, I wouldn't be able to participate. So that's, that has been a really great experience to know everybody and to share uh, across the Atlantic. Um, I'm a choreographer, so um, usually I'm in the studio working with dancers and community projects. Um, I, I also teach choreography and improvisation. Um, and uh, my, my interest in the past maybe seven years goes very much into the uh, cross-disciplinary uh, work that combines science and art. I initiate projects and I collaborate with other artists and, uh, and um, scientists. And there's a very big project that is about to start in November in Israel that I um, actually founded with my friend that recommended the hackathons. So, um, this is really, I'm intrigued by, by cross-disciplinary work and all the outcomes, all the different outcomes that it has. And, and I'm cooking shakshuka. You know what shakshuka is? Yes. <laughs> so I just want to show you from a close perspective, this is a tomato that grew in my garden. Right. And you see it's a bit damaged, so it's not like the perfect tomatoes you would buy in the super or in the grocery shop. And it's a bit soft, it became soft, so I didn't want to throw this toma tomato. And this is the reason why I am cooking shakshuka today, to save and, and pay my uh, respect to this tomato, rescue this wonderful tomato. Excellent, thank you for sharing, Sharona. Um, Maru, would you like to now share with us a little bit about yourself and what you're cooking today? Okay, there you go. Yes. So, hi everyone. My name is Maru Garcia. I'm from Mexico and I'm right now based in LA. I'm an artist, a transdisciplinary artist and researcher and I work at the intersection of art, science, and the environment. Um, I really believe that uh, through art, we are able, and through science, of course, we're able to, to, well, we have the power to change culture, and that's part of the, my main focus in my own practice. So with this project, I really got very excited to, to get to know people that are like-minded in terms of how we can really make an impact in the way that we, uh, treat food and resources and in this case um, uh, well, for today I was uh, thinking what to what to prepare and it was not that uh, difficult usually what happens uh, in our fridges is that we have food that then hello we forget about and uh, in this case there was a package of uh, celery I have to be honest it was not mine but still it was in my fridge and it was going to be <laughs> uh, thrown away. So I was like, of course, it's, it seemed like a little bit of growth and you open the back and you see all like the, the things inside uh, that are starting to get like this. But basically with saving food, it's a matter of taking out the parts that are like not, like starting to erode or like a little bit damaged and taking the things that are good. So instead, uh, of throwing away the big, the complete package, I, I was able to find this portion that it's actually usable. So I would try to chop it and continue working with also some um, carrots. 
this were coming from a service that, and I, don't, I won't say the name, but this kind of service that sells food that it's not the, the one that uh, complies the quality for um, store, stores. Um, so that's another way of saving. And uh, before I, I go deeper into the, the recipe, I just wanted to mention that there is also an other options of having a better relationship with food. And it's through, yeah, probably having as Sharona, your own, um, uh, your own plants and cultivating yourself your food. And otherwise, other ways through um, foraging. So today in the morning, I was also wanting to show that around my area, there is trees and actually there is two blocks from here, a tree from peaches. So they are of course not the big ones and they look a little bit like, yeah, not, not perfect, but I think there is something that can be eaten from here and then I found some mint. So that's what I'm having today and probably we will share it later, but thank you. Thank you, Mari. Right. Thanks, Maru. Um, and last but certainly not least, Jana, would you like to introduce yourself and your recipe for us? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name's Jana. Um, I'm a painter and I make paintings uh, that are abstract, um, sort of about emerging technologies, XR, VR, um, artificial intelligence. I also co-founded a digital media platform called Fembit, which is based in Los Angeles, and it's for women in the arts, um, particularly computer arts. And so it showcases sort of like as a survey on the ground of like sort of what's happening in LA in this particular um, genre. And um, my work in Fembit and my work also in my paintings are sort of also centered around in empowering female narratives and the female voice. So that's a little bit of my background. I also have a background as a writer and a researcher. Um, one article I've published was on, you know, a social critique of humanoid robotics. I sort of dabble in different areas when it comes to innovation and how artists like us can influence um, innovation in an ethical way. Mm -hmm. So that was a big um, reason in sort of joining the hackathon as well. Um, and today, I am making a, it's a rice, so it's a rice cash, casserole, sort of. It's basically an old recipe that is sweet, um, and you add a little bit of honey to it, and it was a recipe my grandfather told me about. Um, during the Great Depression, his mother would make this, so my great-grandma Irma, and it's for leftover rice. Um, in this example, I, you know, use the, the rice cooker for it. Um, but you pretty much just put it in the oven with a little bit of egg, you know, some sweetener, a little dairy, and it comes out and it's quite delicious. And it's just such an easy, nutritious way to like kind of pull like the last little things from your fridge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I'm showing you guys today. And I'm excited to, you know, pull it out and have a little bite. <laughs> in the Thank you. Everyone's going to, I know I'm going to be so hungry by the end of this panel. Yeah. And I'm excited about that to go forage in my fridge and see what I can come up with. Um, as you all can see, we have quite an interesting group of cooks here with lots of different interests and backgrounds and also a lot in common. So the first question we'll pose to you, and I think Jana, I'd love to hear you answer this one. How did this group conceive of the Rescue Cookbook? How did this idea come together and what inspired you? We had come together, you know, through the hackathon. We didn't, um, I didn't know Sharona. Um, so Sharon, you know, we were actually put together as a group um, by you, Isabel. And so you were a big part in the formation of this project, as was Scarlet and Culture Hub, in making this possible and then having, you know, the expert eyes on it, you know, through SciArt. And um, it's just been, it was kind of a wild experience, really, because, you know, we threw out like 10 ideas, I think. Um, and then we finally stumbled on this one, or I sort of couldn't believe that this really, really was it because it's so deceptively simple. Um, it's just about, you know, share, saving the food in your fridge. And yet, if we create a culture around that, the importance is vast. The amount of food we could be saving and the amount of people we could be saving from famine as well is, is just is vast. So um, a little bit of the background as to, you know, the fundamental importance of this is, you know, food famines are very real and it's also just in, become an increasing sort of 
very, very, very increasing problem due to COVID, um, COVID-19. So um, just a couple, you know, statistics globally, one third of all food is wasted, you know, around 1.3 billion tons of food. That's $940 billion each year. So, you know, as well, while as much as 40% of food produced in the U.S. is wasted, food banks are perpetually understocked. So this is, it's not that there isn't always like enough food, it's just that we don't have the distribution channels and set for that. And the, this is becoming an issue right now in the era of COVID. Um, right now, you know, scientists are calling this time the coronavirus famine um, or the coronavirus food crisis. It was projected by Oxfam that by the end of 2020, 12,000 people per day could die from COVID-19 linked hunger. Mm -hmm. um, that was also, you know, through a study through the United Nations stating that a total of 265 million people face acute food insecurity. So, you know, the idea that we could come up with a community ran directory that allows people to source and find food outside of traditional channels became almost dire for us. So that was a lot of the reasoning behind it. I like that you say it's, it's uh, deceptively simple. I agree with that. You would think, oh, it's nothing, but it's so deep and complex. And you already see lines of people waiting for hours and hours for food. And what's uh, striking to me about those lines that you see come from bird's eye drone view is that it's a lot of people with SUVs and they look kind of middle class and you can just see how people are so in debt. They're indebted, so they're obviously not poor as we would think in third world countries, but the system has made them poor. That's uh, right. And, it's, uh, and then your dish, the depression era dish from your grandmother, I think is super interesting because uh, if you go online, you'll find a lot, a lot of depression era cookbooks. And there's a wonderful show with a woman in her 80s on YouTube who shares her recipes. And I think it's, it's, a, it's really a very important connection because it shows how creativity comes into being. Doing something with very, very little and making it delicious and something that the community and the family can share and partake with. It's very cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Victoria. And it, I think we're already talking to this a bit, but I'd love to hear from any of the cooks in, in your mind. How, how would you articulate this project relating to food justice? Um, what are those connections for you? And how do you see the form and the way that the Rescue Cookbook plays out um, connecting to or dealing with food justice? I think we've seen, and as Jana mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has heightened a lot of systematic inequities, um, many interlocking systems of oppression. And for me, this project does really deal with food, food justice. Um, I'd love to hear you speak to that a little more in your own words, any, any, any cook. Sharona, I'm gonna call on people. <laughs> I was waiting for Maru to pick the, the line, but, uh, she's busy cutting up things. My <laughs> uh, my tomatoes and peppers and onions are already on, on in the pan on the fire. So yes, um, I mean, food injustice can be created by circumstances, by um, um, by wars, by pandemics, by um, like. Uh, by, by changing by changing cir circumstances, and I know that we talked about it yesterday, also between the three of us, that I personally come from a culture where, um, where or from a, a home my, in my home, we wouldn't waste food, and I'm I'm very much I, I care about not wasting food, and it has to do with the fact that. I don't take it for granted um, that there is food. I mean, it's a, it's a more of a philosophical idea for me because I, of course, live in, in a country where I have uh, food security and my personal situation has never uh, put me in a, in, a, in a place where 
I was hungry without being able to to um, to satisfy this uh, need or but um, I think that we cannot take it um, for granted that we have food. A lot of people don't have food when they need it. Um, and, um, and, you know, I went today to the grocery shop here in the small village where I live. And I, the, for the first time, I asked the, the, the man at the counter, what, what do you do with the vegetables that you that you don't use or that you want to throw away? And he said to me, well, every day at eight o'clock, I go over the vegetables. I pick what I think it doesn't look good enough and I throw it to the garbage. And uh, I think I'm going to go there tomorrow morning <laughs> and pick the vegetables and do something with it. I mean... Yeah, and I think that's a great segue too. So Sharna, maybe you can um, elaborate more. How exactly would the rescue cookbook or does the rescue cookbook work? What is its form and how, how does it operate out in the world? Well, it's an open form uh, shared by um, people of the community. Um, it's, it's basically a website or, or um, an app um, that you can um, uh, put information in or share information and also look for information about food resources um, around uh, uh, around the, the actual um, um, environment around you I mean so and I think we were mostly thinking about cities where people are also a bit isolated and especially in these times where we are confined a lot to our homes and uh, so we were thinking really about um, an option to share information. So you could uh, say if you, if you, for example, uh, own a shop and it's almost closing time and there, there are bread, uh, there, there is bread left and you want to uh, invite people to come and take it half price or, or um, um, for free. So you put the information in the app and there's a map showing where to go and everyone who is around or wants to come and use that resource is, is, um, is welcome. And on the other side, um, if you have, if you bought the bread and it's like not very nice already to use as, as regular bread and you want to make something out of it. And so you would probably look for a recipe uh, of how to use old bread. And if you have found something or you have a recipe in your family, like something that goes back to times where you used everything that you had. Uh, and so you could share that recipe uh, with a story, with your family story, same way that like Janet did. And so this is in a way at the same time, saving or rescuing food, sharing information about where those resources are and also sharing your personal um, and history or culture. I mean, the shakshuka that I'm cooking is very Israeli typical. Um, and so, I mean, it's something that says something about um, my own culture. And so it's like, um, it saves food and it creates, or it aims to save food and create community at the same time. Here we That's have a problem with, uh... Uh, stores actually locking up the food waste and uh, you can actually get a ticket if you try to dumpster dive and pull out some of the bad food or oh, you know what's considered um, you know, not pretty enough or supposedly you know ran out of its expiration date etc so it's a whole nother layer you have to <laughs> address did you think about that? I mean, especially those living in LA, like how do you deal with the policing of the food waste? Yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, that's, um, sorry, I just jumped <laughs> into it. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's part of the previous question of this injustice because yeah, it's telling how the system is like controlling how we eat basically, what we eat. And um, even like when we were talking about expiration dates, 
some some of the times they are just placed um, those dates without really having like a, um, yeah. a test of what is going to last uh, uh, food. Mm -hmm. So it's also something that it's like encouraging of course more consumption and like people will wouldn't take the time to really uh, open a can and see if the the thing is really uh, bad it would just be the automatic thing of oh okay expiration date whatever i just throw it so yeah i know that we are dealing with a very um difficult situation because it's it goes to the roots and to things that probably sometimes we think are out of our control as the policy uh, situation of food that could be um, rescued that way. But still, I've seen some places that have uh, that as a, as a way to also contribute to the situation, like meaning that they are able to really put outside their stores. I've been like, twice uh, outside some of the big stores and they were just like probably the store not it, it was the one that was uh, sharing the food but actually the providers the ones that are bringing the food to the store and probably they the food was not received they were the ones that were like giving away all this food so yeah that's something that yeah we know it's difficult to to really address but probably uh, our our point here is that there is always a way <laughs> uh, of making this a thing and really a start from our own kitchens is also another uh, thing, another point that we are really trying to, to bring. And the idea of using technology, even if it's like, yeah, very simple, like a platform, an app, um, uh, is also making us realize that, yeah, sometimes technology has uh, created this distance between people like making us all live in our own places like very isolated and everything but also technology can help us to really make connections and that's why uh, we are thinking as this platform as a way to connect connect ourselves with the community but also connect uh, make us think in our relationship with food so yeah nice Thank you. Yeah, and I appreciated that so much about this project that I think folks tend to hear use technology in some way and they immediately go to the most cutting edge or complicated way that that can be used. And I think the choice to use it as a platform for sharing ideas and sharing information and in effect creating practices of relocalization in these discrete areas throughout the globe was a really strong structure um, and a really great way to begin, Mario, as you're saying, creating these reconnections with ourselves, with our food and in communities that perhaps we don't come into contact with in our own regions as much. Um, I know Sharona had a great anecdote about Arctic chokes that in my mind I could just imagine meeting lots of new folks from my own, own town that maybe I didn't know in that process. So I know Kate, I think Caitlin has a question for us next, but Sharona, would you like to tell everyone the, the artichoke story because it's a wonderful anecdote of how this functions. I mean, I think the cookbook really is about caring. <clears throat> it's really about caring for ourselves and for the environment and for the resources that we have. And, and really from that care comes the need to rescue. And during the, 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 the first month of the pandemic here in Israel, the village where I live, uh, there are um, um, farmers. And one of the farmers grows artichokes. Like there are huge fields of artichokes um, when you step out of the, of the village. And but the, uh, the artichokes are usually um, delivered to restaurants or to specific shops uh, across the country or even sent away abroad. Um, um, and so the, the farmer got stuck with, with tons of artichokes without being able to actually distribute them. And uh, as a last resort, he offered the artichokes to the people of the village. So we went to buy artichokes and we all came back with, with a huge, like 15 kilos of uh, artichokes, each one of us. And it's, it's a bit complicated how to cook it and what to do with it. And suddenly came this rumor, like it was traveling between people, 
that there's a fantastic recipe uh, of artichoke and very simple. You just cut it in the middle. You put it in a, on a, um, um, what do you call it? Um, um, an oven uh, pan with olive oil and you put it in the oven for 15 minutes with salt and pepper and it's delicious. And everybody was talking about it in the village. It was like everybody was cooking artichokes in the same way. And I think that that, that story kind of, it was, it was lying there in my, in my conscience when, when we came together for the, the hackathon. It really made an impression on me and uh, try it, it's really good. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I love well so many things about that. I, I love the two words together, artichoke antidote. That's those are great. I also <laughs> love <laughs> of, of the artichoke is like the you eat you sort of consume the heart and it's kind of like visceral, like it's very visceral and like to eat an artichoke because you're just like sucking and slurping and it I don't know, it's just very like an and eating the heart, but also having like an entire community brought by brought together by the coronavirus in this case is actually really quite beautiful. Um, my question is actually is about accessibility. So in terms of social and food justice, um, a lot of the issues that we all are aware of and we're all sort of talking about um, happen very readily in homeless populations. And so how does the Rescue Cookbook work for people who might not have access to the internet or a smartphone and also potentially even not have access to a kitchen? I can, oh, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. I think in an ideal context, um, the Rescue Cookbook would also be coordinating with food banks in the area not only for those reasons, but also because of their practice in social distancing right now during the pandemic. It's very, is a great concern that we're sharing um, and which is important for food, but also, you know, the safety of that in a pandemic, you know, that can't be, that can't be understated. So I think that is one way that we would like to coordinate, you know, have the food banks and reach out to them so then they can coordinate with the website and then they can also reach out and, and spread the word about, about that information. I also think that, you know, we, 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 you know, made it sort of low tech or like a low threshold of digital literacy just by having it as a website. We didn't want it, you know, I think that was important to do because that is a baseline for, you know, bringing as many people as possible to the platform. And um, I think, you know, as we move forward, we'd probably need uh, another hackathon, Isabel, actually, to tackle, um, you know, that, that other, you know, aspect where what happens when, no, you know, there is no internet connection. So it's, it's, it, is, it is the next sort of step, I think, in, you know, working, about, working with this. Um, I will say in smaller towns, um, you know, there is almost a network as, of people like Sharona said, working together and sort of who know each other. I'm just speaking from, you know, my mom is from Fairbanks, Alaska and like the whole town pretty much shares food resources. Um, in larger cities, however, um, when you're anonymous, like in Los Angeles, for example, um, you know, there's 10 million of us. So I think if, if the cookbook were to do um, sort of a, the intended goal would be to allow you to get to know your neighbors. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd look forward to how that would be conceived um, outside of the website itself. So something to think about. Something just occurred to me. Isn't there a pretty straightforward way to uh, collaborate with food banks and with places like churches and other community centers that are already set up for that and that could really use help, number one, but also some education about the food that could be provided to people. A lot of times it's just junk food in the end or not very nutritious food that they end up having. So it, it could be a relatively simple kind of arm that wouldn't have to start from scratch in any way. It wouldn't really require a hackathon, I think. Yeah. Um, 
maybe as simple as some pamphlets that help people uh, and then collaborating with the food banks could be a, LA certainly could use that mm -hmm. I know that yeah um, and talking about resources I think that yeah it's not that we are really wanting to to make uh, the work of all these great organizations that they already have, as you mentioned, Victoria, the expertise they have, the, like the group of people, and they they know what they're doing. Is uh, probably what we also want is try to create this uh, accessible. So uh, part of the idea is to partner with them, but also have those uh, links uh, also containing our own um, mm -hmm. cookbook. So people can be directed to whatever uh, they are needing. Uh, for example, I just uh, knew about this. Um, um, it's an initiative that is called LA Community Bridges. And it's, uh, I think it just started the, during this pandemic. I'm, I'm not super sure, but I can research more about that. And basically what happens is that uh, store owners allow uh, this organization to come and put a fridge outside of their store. They, the only requirement is the usage of electricity, and this organization provides the food and, bring, and makes sure that the fridge is always with food, and people from the community around are able to go and pick whatever they want. Also, the, the community that, it, that has uh, resources are also able to go and put food there. So, of course, it takes a lot of logistics, people that are really needing to go and check these places. So, I think connecting people with that type of resources would be the ideal, and that's part of our intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm probably, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go for it. I was just going to echo some of the, you know, threads being brought up, and I, I'm really inspired by this peer-to-peer -peer format because I feel um, really disrupts the kind of capitalistic production chain. I, something that I was really surprised by when I moved to the US um, was because I was so used to shopping in farmers markets and kind of traditional markets in Korea where it's all kind of a lot of bartering, a lot of exchange, a lot of haggling, um, a lot of like direct uh, farmer to um, consumer kind of relationships and you build kind of long-term relationships and you also kind of buy together with your neighbors and there's a kind of like shared economy of um, uh, food becomes something more, I guess, directly related to family and survival rather than something that's um, kind of valued uh, in a marketable way as a capitalist product. So it's so interesting um, hearing of, like the, our uh, earlier topic of dumpster diving. I, when I used to live in Chicago, there were so many interesting dumpster diving co-ops, but it was always stigmatized um, mm -hmm. as like this criminal activity. So it's, it's kind of, and then there's all of these policing and laws surrounding that. So it ends up being this very precarious um, activity to do. And it's interesting to think about like all the marketable standards of food, like food, food having to look a certain way or be a certain way to check the boxes to be in the big box source and then like what happens to everything else but then we but then people can't have access to the thing that's not checking the boxes so it's yeah that's that's so i mean it feels absurd and it feels um uh so arbitrary in a way and it feels very much like food becomes this <laughs> fictional object or this kind of um uh, thing that's that represents something rather than something that's like so material and non-representative like it is what it is it doesn't you know you eat food and it becomes a part of your body so yeah that's that's really interesting and I'm I'm just curious to see I'm really excited to see how this project can kind of facilitate uh, different relationships to food something that um, allows us to think outside of um, our ingrained you know, conditioned ideas of how we behave with food. Thank you for that, Scarlett. Yeah, I love that idea of disrupting sort of the typical systems, at least in the U.S., of food distribution and the commodification of food, which at times feels like a luxury rather than an essential. Um, and I, I love that you bring this up now because I think one really interesting thing that happens when you put a lot of artists together is that ideas like this come forth. So I'd love to ask the cooks now, any, anyone can answer this, but how did this project relate to your respective art practice? And what do you think the, the, an artist can bring to some of these conversations that might be new or different or exciting? 
Um, I just want to add something to what you said before, and then I'll relate to what you asked right now. I mean, I met, I met this wonderful woman um, two days ago in a, in a food salvage workshop she gave. And um, thinking of how the cookbook can, uh, the rescue cookbook can relate to already existing projects and support and, and bring, bring the efforts work together to, or bring the, the partners that are already working in the field um, this woman created um, 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 a volunteering organization that really saves tons of food every day in the, in the great market of uh, food and vegetables in Jerusalem. So um, I think she practically saved by now 150 tons of, of uh, edible um, um, fruit and vegetables. And they are now thinking of like building small shops, or it's not, it's the word in Israel is in Hebrew is basta. I don't know how you say it in English, but it's like a stall or like a small, uh, a pop-up shop would be, uh, would be more appropriate, where they actually create relations with the people that, that, that come and take the food. So it's not only this, this, uh, giving action or, you know, I have and I come and I give and all these, all the, all the things that go with this like so-called charity uh, action or like this attitude of, of the, the stronger giving to the weaker and stuff like that. So they're really trying to, to, to create a setting where all this organization really involves the community that, that needs the food. So it's not this passive and active thing but it comes together as something that creates a community that works for the community and engages the people in a more uh, active uh, and, and supportive way. Um, and to your question, how does this relate to my practice, my existing practice? Um, I think I am very busy now with community. Um, or changing or shifting my attitude between audience to community. Uh, and in Hebrew, it works very nice. I mean, audience and community have nothing in, com in common in English, but in Hebrew, audience is kahal, and the, um, and the community is kehila. It's the same root, it's the same letters, it's the same idea. So it's like this ability to change from, or, or the need, I think, this, this time brings to, to shift from having performers and an audience um, into a community that involves uh, all the people sharing this experience and creating it together. And this is something that I am very busy um, thinking and, 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 and reforming or rethinking my practice. It's something that I've been doing before, but now it's, it feels more urgent. There's an urgency, I feel, to, to rethink um, how do I relate to, to the community of the dancers and to the community of the people that, that I share my work with. And I think that that relates very much to the cookbook idea. So speaking of community, there's a question from a participant from Israel asking if participants or attendees can share their recipes. Do you have a way that after this panel, people can contribute their recipes? The, the, the website already exists. I think you shared it in the chat, did you? Yes. Okay, and so there's the form there where you can actually uh, put your name and share your recipe with a story, not yet a picture, but if the rescue cookbook would actually go fully live, there would be an opportunity also to, to upload pictures. And actually the, the, the cookbook is created by the people um, sharing their recipes and it kind, it kind, it's, it's a work of, um, of um, compiling or adding to the, to the, um, to the community cookbook. So everyone is invited actually. It would be fantastic. Wonderful, thank you. And Sharona, Maru, and Jana, will you all be sharing your recipes that you're cooking today in that cookbook? Yes, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm probably, uh, well, trying to answer the, the question and probably the three of us probably can, can answer how this relates to our practices. Um, I can say in my case, I'm always interested on trying to think um, as my practice as a way of create relationships. The relationships can be with uh, other organisms, usually plants, but other, some other organisms that could be microscopic or macroscopic, and of course with other humans, right? So uh, in this case, the relationship that I'm uh, exploring through this project is with the, the other people that are around me or the people that are also wanting to, to create this type of, uh, well, the, to think about this new way of eating and to e relate with food. So I think there is a very good connection in that. And of course, the idea of this being a, a way to also engage with environmental concerns that I'm really fond to that. Uh, it's also another way that it's connected. Um, of course, um, John already mentioned the amount of uh, food that is wasted and is thrown away. And that means also energy that is being wasted. Uh, all the energy that comes for, like for, the, for the production from starting with agricultural, uh, all the, the process for, for um, putting together like or to create this, this food, also the distribution channels, then uh, the energy that goes into the stores that sell them. Like, so there is so much energy that is wasted for it to be then a packaging also it's part of it so everything is connected there so for me there is another this is another way to really try to contribute uh with this uh environmental crisis that we are living so that was my yeah my answer great we just have uh, one or two more questions and then it'll be time to start sharing and wrapping up but i wanted to give jana the opportunity to share as well about your practice before we move oh yeah um you know like as a painter and as an artist i have you know been inspired by interdisciplinary approaches to you know the content i work with um i think you know i i the art pedagogy um, and post post modernity, for example, you know, I can't really understand it in a vacuum. I like how, you know, art can be um, about or discuss uh, what actually like the material effects on everybody's lives, kind of like food, water, shelter, the fundamentals. And I think um, science inspired art does that really well. So that was something I was thinking about, you know, fundamentally when I make art, even if it's paintings, it's about, it's about people. It's always been sort of about connecting to people. Um, the reason I joined the hackathon was to connect actually just to the community of artists like in the area or globally or who's thinking about this. So that, that's probably, you know, that's probably my starting point for most of my research and inquiry and, and yeah, why, why I was excited about this project. I'm really curious <clears throat> about what, what you all see as your next steps, both to the cooks, um, what are some next steps as you uh, envision developing this project, um, and to Isabel for what are what is the future of the Climate Chamber Hackathon, and um, uh, we were all remarking in one of our meetings of how um, the structure and the participatory um, strategies within the hackathon was so conducive towards um, this project being imagine so I'm, I'm curious about um yeah about what you're imagining uh everyone for the future of um, all of these great conversations and projects sure i can i can start and then i'll let the cooks tell us about how what's next for the cookbook and how all of you watching can participate um Briefly, I was really excited about the structure of the hackathon as I'd seen this type of structure work really well in the past, especially for tech communities who come together in these interdisciplinary teams and in a matter of days come up with a prototype for a project, a product. And I had participated in a few similar structures with MIT, um, with A2RU, which is an Alliance for Art and Research Universities as a student at one of their events and found um, also myself that I got really excited and that really new ideas were generated in these intensive environments. Um, 
also I use the title climate chamber because it is a tool that is used to test um, different climactic conditions and within these chambers you can learn a lot um, about about those conditions and what happens within them um, so I wanted to apply the hackathon structure to creative projects. I think myself and cohort of artists that I'm in contact with are always looking for ways to connect, not only with other artists, but with scientists, with designers, with folks in other um, fields. And I thought that it would be a really great way to ignite that and to initiate that by having all of these incredible producers come together and see what could be made. Um, so I thought the 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 hackathon went really well. I'd love to host more climate chambers with slightly different foci. You know, this one really was on um, climate with the lens of COVID and working remotely. And as we all know, there are endless numbers of issues we could really focus on and generate innovative ideas for. Um, and I'll say, I think the best benefit is seeing the cascades and the of each team then meets a group of new folks from around the world and hopefully that spark of innovation and the ignition of these new ideas can go out from there and really generate more and more of this type of creative energy. So for me as well, it's all about connecting and networking and, um, and, and getting excited about ideas together. So hopefully more virtual and physical climate chambers will happen in the future. Um, but I'll throw it back to the cooks. If you all want to share what's next for the rescue cookbook and how folks can become involved. I know we talked about the website already, but um, extra call to action for everyone. And then we have one wrap up question um, before we can all head out. I mean, the, the condition of the environment is such a frustrating uh, issue. I mean, doesn't matter how much you do, it feels like it's such a big, um, huge problem. And um, it really feels good to, to do something very simple and very um, handy uh, towards making something a bit better. I mean, just a small thing. Um, and um, I'm really hoping that maybe, I don't know, I, I, um, the, about the future of the cookbook, I think um, it has to do with some kind of a collaboration with an existing um, um, structure or institution or, or like the, the, the woman I met in Jerusalem was, I told her briefly about the rescue cookbook and she said, wow, we have to come together. I, I was really, I wanted to make a cookbook and what you're saying is really something that I had in mind and it, this is really wonderful. We have to meet, I, I really, I'm very curious about this idea. So it felt that if this could be uh, made um, practical or, or put into use in already existing organizations or, or so then it would, could, you know, spread around and, and be shared and, um, and create its own value. So to squeeze in one last question that I actually think is important maybe to end as a note with for the cooks. Uh, did you consider uh, fruits that are over trees in public property, there's a group here in LA you, you're familiar with, the Edible Gardens. And then also, what about weeds and um, weeds that are in urban areas that could be used for food? Are you planning to integrate that into your cookbook is the question from the audience. I mean, in Israel during the winter, there are, there are a lot of edible uh, weeds and things that you can actually gather from your surrounding. Um, well, how do you say it in English? The, the, the small pickles, I, for the first time this year I made something that I never did before. Um, and it was by walking around and discovering this kind of small, it's not a fruit, uh, I'll check it and see, but, but I kind of started collecting it and put it into salt and water and then I have them uh, um, ready to eat now. I mean, so it's, it's really just a point of attitude. 
Yeah. I mean, when you have that point of view, it, it kind of takes everything around you and, and you, you, you look at your surrounding with a different perspective. And so everything becomes um, relevant um, yeah. and saving for or using uh, abundant uh, resources around you. Mm. Exactly. And probably, uh, yeah, coming from, from that same uh, uh, question, I think that this is really something that the community itself can explore. Of course, right now we're in this uh, uh, prototype situation in which we are like getting ideas. And of course, if someone from the audience is really interested and really wants to, to share some ideas of why, how can we this make possible, it would be great if they can uh, contact us through through our website uh, but yeah that, that would be great as well like as I mentioned like even going out I found mint I found um, peaches that were just on the ground and the, this tree is there growing and always when I walk around I see so many of, of this just in the ground uh, rotting yes. <laughs> and nobody eats them and well that just the, the the insects of course and that's great <laughs> but uh, but we still can be able to walk around and to pin, for example. I know that there is an organization that is uh, actually doing that, that has this map, and you can pin where is uh, a tree uh, that you can uh, forage from. <laughs> so yeah, that that type of information can be something that someone around here can know that there is a tree that has really good features because I already eat, uh, ate a lot of them in the past. And yeah, the, as, as Sharana mentioned, there is abundance. It's just the way that we look at things, basically. Capers. <laughs> Capers. <That's incredible. laughs> um, I like that. I think that's a beautiful fun. note to um, end our conversation on. As we sign off, I would love for each of the cooks to share their updates on, the, on what they've been cooking today. And I think this is for... Oh, look at Sharana, almost done. This is the shakuka. Well, for all of us, one point of inspiration or resource or an idea that we'd love to share. Yeah, I wish you could be here to, to share it with me. Uh, me too. That looks so delicious. Wow. Yes. Can you pick it up again? Let me take a closer look. I want to smell it. It's it's onions and garlic oh. with uh, tomatoes and peppers yeah. and there's a, a, a specific um, 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 seasoning also it's called zatal zatal is, uh, is a yeah. uh, and at the end and you add a bit of uh, pepper sugar and and salt and then at the end you add the eggs and that's a perfect breakfast for you guys there in LA. God, I am not, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> I would love to go make perfect some of that. Brunch, yeah. <laughs> Mara and Jana, what's the progress? Well, in my case, I already cleaned um, all the, um, the celery and the carrots. <laughs> they, they look pretty now. <laughs> and I will cook uh, another soup because I already cooked yesterday one, but doesn't matter. We can always keep it in the freezer. <laughs> but yeah, I will, I will cook a soup with this. Wonderful. And Jana, the, your grandmother's recipe, how's that coming? It is totally done. And um, it's not as gorgeous as Sharona's okay. at all. <laughs> but it is tasty. It is tasty. So, um, and this time I added cinnamon, which just oh, rounded wow. it perfectly. I'm so excited. This is going to be my um, late, my brunch. Mm. I think everybody should say mm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for to the audience to those who were sharing this virtual space with for being here with us today to the cooks and artists for inviting us into their kitchens. Um, it was so wonderful. And to me felt like we did create more intimacy with each other by being able to witness the food, talk about the food and share um, all of our ideas together and histories and familial histories and artichoke anecdotes. So um, I look forward to seeing how the Rescue Cookbook continues to develop. 
Um, for anyone watching, if you want to know more, we really hope to continue interacting and engaging with you after this presentation. So absolutely visit the Rescue Cookbook website, um, visit the Ars Electronica website for uh, getting in contact with us, finding our names again, if you need that. And um, thank you so much to Caitlin and Victoria as well and UCLA Art Sci Center for um, creating this incredible set of programming for Telluric Vibrations. We're so grateful. It's a great, great pleasure. Thank you so much. And Isabel, you're a real pro. We really appreciate you. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Everybody. Thank you. Let's thank you, everyone. Bye. Go Bye. eat breakfast. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bon appétit. <laughs>